Thank you. Well, I um, have to use a microphone that I'm going to close, hold close to me because I don't have a voice. Is that there we are? So thank you very much. It's a privilege to be here uh, at this university. I love this place. I've been here many times over my lifetime. Sorry, I had no voice on Saturday, and this thing usually my voice gets better, but it uh, doesn't seem to be. So I hope you'll be able to uh, hear me. Um, uh, it's the privilege of my life for 30 years to have worked with thousands and thousands of gang members and to know them well. Uh, folks who uh, have realigned my heart and uh, really altered my way of seeing. The day won't ever come when I have more courage or I am more noble or I am closer to God than these folks. Uh, people like Joey Ray, who uh, got out of Mule Creek State Prison and came to work for us <clears throat> at Homeboy. And uh, he did all the things that people do in our training program, but he kind of became a speaker. So we would send him out to schools, and he was much in demand. And uh, now he's actually on a TV show, a, a spinoff of, uh, uh, what's that, Anarchy, Sons of Anarchy or something? It, I don't know, I don't watch it, but, um, <laughs> but don't tell Joey that, because uh, he's a big gang member. Um, <laughs> so we went out to dinner, and he'd, be, he'd become such a good speaker. We went out to dinner, and he was giving me tips on how to speak publicly. <clears throat> he says, you know, you have to pepper your talk with self-defecating humor. <laughs> I said, yeah, no shit. <laughs> That's some good advice there. So brace yourselves. Uh, what brings you out here tonight, I think, is uh, not me, but kind of a longing in your hearts to uh, align yourself uh, with God's dream hoping to come true. If we ask ourselves, what, what is the thing that quenches God's thirst? And I think we know that it's in the end, our own union with each other. Jesus says clearly that you may be one. I suppose he could have been more self-referential, but it's really about us. And that's important. Mother Teresa diagnosed the world's ills correctly when she suggested that the problem in the world is that we've just forgotten that we belong to each other. So how do we stand against forgetting that? How do we imagine with God a circle of compassion and then imagine nobody standing outside that circle? How do we dismantle the barriers that exclude? And as Pope Francis calls us all, we're to go to the margins, because if you go to the margins, look under your feet, the margins are getting erased precisely because you chose to stand there. And you stand with a kind of particularity with the poor and the powerless and the voiceless. You stand with those whose dignity has been denied and those whose burdens are more than they can bear. I suspect everyone here has had the exquisite privilege of being able to stand with the easily despised and the readily left out, with the demonized, so that the demonizing might stop, and with the disposable, so that the day would come when we stop throwing people away. No kinship, no peace. No kinship, no justice. No kinship, no equality. No matter how singularly focused we may well be on these worthy goals, they actually can't happen unless there's some undergirding belief that we belong to each other. I suspect if kinship happened to be our goal, 
we would no longer be promoting justice. We'd be celebrating it. So the only way that makes any sense is if we anchor ourselves in the God who loves us without measure and without regret. The God who is too busy loving us to have any time left to be disappointed. We want to know the God, as St. Ignatius says, the God who's always greater. How do we arrive at that guy? And so we know that it's an evolving, growing thing. And we're trying to find the spacious, expansive God that we know we have. Uh, the homies, um, uh, you know, kind of illuminate things for me in a lot of ways, but they do it uh, often be, by way of mangling the English language in a way that's not just charming, but it also kind of points the way to something different. But like I had a homegirl named Lisa, one of our trainees, a gang member, who came into my office at the end of the day after at five o'clock when things were ending. And her man had come to pick her up, so she wanted to introduce him to me, and she said, this is my sufficient other. <laughs> I said, no doubt. <laughs> but what allows me to be here is the fact that I have a CEO running our $19 million annual operation. And I'm happy uh, not to have to worry too much about cash flow and budgets. He does that, and that's nice. And so I had a homie come into my office the other day, and he said, damn, gee, my lady, she is in a bad mood today. And I said, why? Well, you know, she's beginning her administration period. <laughs> I say, well, I'm just finishing mine. <laughs> so kind of know what she's going through. But my favorite one happened in a gym uh, at a San Fernando Juvenile Hall. And it had about 500 kids in it, gang members mainly, males. and. Uh, so I was presiding, and I had my album and my stole, and they were all in the chairs on the floor. And sometimes when you do this, when you preside, you, you go, I'm going to close my eyes and listen to the words proclaimed. And so uh, I did, and the, the homies got up, and they did the readings, and some kid got up to do the psalm. And uh, with an overabundance of confidence, he, he said, the Lord is exhausted. <laughs> and I looked at the sheet, I said, what the hell? <clears throat> the Lord is exalted. And I remember thinking at the time, wow, that's way better. <laughs> you know, the truth of the matter is we all create a God in our own image. We're constantly doing it. And if we were God, we'd want to be exalted. I mean, that's the truth. But if you think about it, ah, who wants to spend eternity with a God for whom that matters? I like the exhausted God. <laughs> you know, like when somebody says, how are you feeling? Oh, I'm, I'm pooped. But it's a good tired. You know how that is? And it's always a good tired because you spent yourself on another human being. Oh, I helped a friend move into her apartment. Oh, I, I had the grandkids all weekend. I'm pooped. But it's a good tired. And that's kind of the God we have. A God who's too busy loving us. I think we, there's a God we actually have. And then there's the God we've settled for. They're not the same. The God we've settled for is a partial God, a lesser God, yeah, a more realistic God. It's important to be on the lookout for the God we actually have. So when Dylan Roof killed those eight people in Mother Emanuel Church, a week later, family members of the victims stood in front of him and said, we forgive you. And everyone knew 
We were in the presence of the God we actually have. But nine months later, when they sentenced him to die and people said, this is God's justice, you knew you were in the presence of the God we've settled for, the partial God, the lesser God, yeah, the more realistic God. It will not make any sense at all to go to the margins unless we can locate the tenderness of the God we actually have and feel the tender glance of God and then exhaust ourselves in extending that glance to others. This is no small thing because we want to be in the world who God is and we want to know what it is that God longs for us to do and to be. I was giving a talk once at a kind of a shishi fufu private school. Uh, <coughs> one of those K to 12, uh, and it was at night and it was just parents. There were no kids there. Well, there was one kid and he was in the front row. I find out later his name is Diego. And he's 10 years old and I'm doing my thing and I look out at him and anything I say that's funny, he's howling with laughter. And I'm thinking, and you know, you kind of stand out of yourself a little bit. I go, wow, how's he getting all these jokes? And then when I say something that might require you being slack-jawed, he'd get slack-jawed. And I'm going, wow. And then I ended that night with a story that is from tattoos about youngster and puppet who were enemies, wouldn't talk to each other. Then puppet is beaten to death. And youngster calls me. And actually, I was at St. Louis University when he was beaten to death. I flew home. I was giving a talk here. And he was on life support for um, 48 hours. And youngster calls me and he says, uh, that's messed up about what happened to Puppet. And I said, yeah, it is. And then he says, is there anything I can do? Can I give him my blood? And we both fall silent under the weight of it. And then he, he chokes back his tears and he says with great deliberation, he was not my enemy, he was my friend. We work together. So I end my talk with that story. While I look at Diego, he's sobbing. He's doubled over. He's wailing. I mean, he's, he's really undone and has so entered into the truth of the story. And his mother is sitting next to him. And she very gently and lovingly moves her arm and then wants to rest it on his shoulders. But as soon as she makes contact, what Diego does next is a showstopper. As soon as she lands on his shoulder, he turns to her and says, what? <laughs> and, and I shut up, everybody turns and looks and he demurs a little, but not very much. And then he says, what? Well, anybody who has been a teenager or has raised a teenager, you know exactly what that is. Uh, how have I embarrassed you? What is it that you'd like me to do? Um, what is it that's really bothering you right now? How am I a disappointment to you? And yet it was so clear to me that the mother had only two things on her mind. One, how in the world did I get so lucky to have a son like you? Clear. And the second thing was this. What breaks your heart breaks mine too. That was it. 
utterly clear. But we live our lives thinking and directing our gaze to God. What? <laughs> what do you want from me? When in fact, our God doesn't want anything from us, only for us. I say that because nobody believes this. And yet that's the depth and the power of the kind of God we have, this exhausted God who is inviting us to the margins to create a community of kinship such that God in fact might recognize it. That is the only thing that will quench God's thirst. But we know what this is. We know the God we actually have in the deepest part of us where we try to rest in the stillness of love and then love in the stillness of God, we know the kind of God we have. And we know that God only wants for us, not from us. We don't have to measure up, we don't have to perform. And even in asking us to create a community of kinship, that God is still not asking something from us because that's where the joy is in our kinship with each other. What does God want for us? My joy, yours. Your joy, complete. I was reading a Q&A with Whoopi Goldberg and they asked her, what living person do you most admire? And she said, Pope Francis. And then she adds, yeah, he's going with the original program. <laughs> now I love that, and I have to tell you that every time I say that, People do what you, what you just did. What does that say that says, people get this. You know what the original program is. We all know what kind of God we actually have. We know this. We long for this. It is the only thing we want. We want to take seriously what Jesus took seriously. Inclusion. Nonviolence, unconditional, compassionate, loving kindness, that's one thing. <laughs> and acceptance. That's the original program. We want to roll up our sleeves and be a part of that. And it's about kinship, it's about connection, it's about exquisite mutuality, and the homies have taught me so much about that. But in the last few years, they've taught me how to text, and I'm so grateful to them. <laughs> because I find that it sure beats the heck out of actually talking to people. <laughs> and I'm pretty good at it, you know, LOL and OMG and BTW, and the homies have taught me a new one, OHN, which apparently stands for, oh, hell no. <laughs> And I've been using that one quite a bit lately. <laughs> and I know I can't be alone in being vexed by this autocorrect thing. And I had a homegirl named Bertha on a Sunday. She texted me, where are you at? And I said, I'm about to speak to a room full of monjas. And monjas is Spanish for nuns, sisters. I'm about to speak to a room full of monjas. And I pushed send. And autocorrect told her I was about to speak to a room full of ninjas. <laughs> which, trust me, she thought was pretty darn interesting. <clears throat> and just right now, even all, uh, so I've been here for a couple days and I am getting homies with their hair on fire. You know, I, they're going to cut off my lights and I just need to do this and my car is in the shop. They always need money, and, and this one guy once said I, he needed $100 to finish off his rent, 
and I didn't have it. So I wrote back, things are tight. I pushed send and autocorrect told him, thongs are tight. <laughs> And he wrote back, sorry to hear that. <laughs> uh, uh, what about my rent? <laughs> so there I am in a car with two uh, homies, older vatos, Manuel and Poncho, and we're gonna go uh, give a talk in Palm Desert at a high school. And Manuel's in the front seat, and, and we're about 15 minutes on the road when Mandel gets an incoming uh, text and he reads it to himself and he chuckles. And I said, what is it? He goes, oh, it's dumb. It's from Snoopy back at the office. Well, I'd just seen Snoopy. Snoopy greeted me in the, at our morning meeting where we all 300 of us gather. He gave me a big abrazo. Manuel and Snoopy worked together in the clock-in room where they clock in hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of our workers. It's a tough job. I, I wouldn't actually want it you know, because this may come as a surprise. Gang members can occasionally be attitudinal. <laughs> <clears throat> so I asked Manuel, well, what's he say? Oh, hang on, it's dumb, hang on, let me just find it here. Oh, here it is. Hey dog, it's me, Snoops. Yeah, they got my ass locked up in county jail. They're charging me with being the ugliest vato in America. <laughs> You have to come down right now, show them they got the wrong guy. <laughs> <coughs> well, I nearly drove into oncoming traffic. I, the three of us, we laughed so damn hard. And, then, and I realized that Manuel and Snoopy are enemies. They're from rival gangs. They used to shoot bullets at each other. Now they shoot text messages. And there's a word for that, and the word is kinship. How do we obliterate once and for all the illusion that we are separate, that there is an us and a them? And that's kind of an essential thing. Even in our service, because we want to align ourselves with the original program, and we want to imitate the kind of God we have. And service is a good place to start, but we can't end there. Service is the hallway that gets you to the ballroom. You want to get to the ballroom because that's God's dream come true. That's the exquisite mutuality of kinship. No us and them, just us. My joy, yours, your joy complete. God doesn't want anything from us. God just wants us to get to the ballroom where there is no daylight that separates us. And yet in service, there kind of is, you know, service provider, service recipient, there's a distance there. And it's okay, but you don't want it to remain. At Homeboy Industries, I'm not the great healer, and that gang member over there is in need of my exquisite healing. The truth be told, we're all in need of healing. We're all a cry for help. It's in fact one of those things that joins us together as members of the human family. And that's what we hope for. One of the great privileges of my life was knowing Cesar Chavez as a friend. And uh, he was about the best listener I've ever been in the presence of. If you were having a conversation with him, nobody else existed. Laser beam focused. He was never looking over your shoulder to see if someone more important was on the approach. But once quite famously, a reporter had commented to him, wow, these farm workers, they sure love you. And Sessa shrugged and smiled and said, the feeling's mutual, which is the hope. You don't go to the margins to make a difference. You go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make you different. I, I ran into a, a, a homie in Houston who, uh, uh, I can't believe I just said that word. Uh, 
Um, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, don't, don't get me to, I'm from Los Angeles, what, what can I tell you? So uh, I was there and uh, a guy, a hardcore gang intervention worker out of prison that was working with gang members in the streets and he came up to me and he said, how do you reach them? And I said, for starters, stop trying to reach them. Can you be reached by them? Can you receive who they are? Can you find yourself in this mutually ennobling moment where both of you are returned to yourselves, where, where people are discovering they're valuable just because we decided to value them? A no homie found more job opportunities through our organization than a homie everybody called Dreamer. I knew him since he was a little mococito growing up in the housing projects. And he got into a gang, and he had older brothers from a gang, and had a hard life. Super smart kid, very intelligent. Uh, though I don't recall he ever really went to school or anything. He had a dangerous sense of humor, which I always enjoyed. He's in his 40s now, doing well. But when he was in his early 20s, he was a kind of a yo-yo, in and out of being locked up, and he would... Uh, come and see me and I'd find him a job in the private sector or in one of our social enterprises. But before too long, he would gravitate back to vague criminality, usually something involving drugs, the sale of or the use of, and then he'd wander back to me. So it was a pattern that kept presenting itself. So this one time he had finished a uh, four month stretch a probation violation in county jail. And there he is sitting in front of my desk and he says what gang members often say, this time it'll be different. I go, mm, all right. So I, with him sitting there, I pick up the phone, I call a friend of mine named Gary who owns a vending machine company. And he had hired homies in the past. So I'm thinking maybe he'll do it again. And this guy, Gary, says, yeah, you tell that guy he can start tomorrow. That's a holy man right there. So Dreamer began work at the vending machine company the next day. Well, two weeks later, there he is again in front of my desk. I couldn't even believe it. And I said, hijo le madre santa, here we go all over again. But this time he pulls out of his pocket his very first paycheck and he waves it proudly. And he says, damn, gee, this paycheck makes me feel proper. <laughs> I mean, my mom, she's proud of me and my kids, they're not ashamed of me. And you know who I have to thank for this job. And I said, well, gosh, <laughs> who? And he looked at me strangely and he said, well, God, of course. <laughs> oh, sure, no. <clears throat> That's right, that, that would be God. <laughs> you thought I was gonna say you. I said, no, no, gosh, God's number one. I said, you are so lucky. We're not living in them Genesis days. I'm sorry, them Genesis days? He goes, yeah, because God would have been had Struck down your ass already by now. <laughs> <clears throat> well, the only thing I recall was that the two of us, we literally fell out of our chairs. We were laughing so hard. And I defy you to identify exactly who's the service provider, who's the service recipient. It's mutual. So, as was mentioned in the kind introduction, Homeboy Industries was born a long time ago, in 1988, the last time the Dodgers won the World Series. <laughs> I'm sorry, a friend of mine, I don't know if you're here, said, don't mention the Dodgers. <laughs> We're all adults. So, <clears throat> When I was a, a pastor of the poorest parish in the city, Dolores Mission, nestled in the middle of two public housing projects, highest concentration of gang activity in the world. So if LA was the gang capital of the world, 
My parish was the gang capital of Los Angeles. So we had eight gangs at war with each other. Uh, I buried my first young person killed because of the sadness in 88 and, and my 222nd uh, two weeks ago. Obviously not all from that community, but I know a lot of gang members. <coughs> first thing we did was we started a school because there were so many junior high age gang members who had been given the boot from their home school, nobody wanted them. So they were violent, wreaking havoc. They weren't in school, writing on the walls, selling drugs. So I walked out to them and I'd kind of isolate them. And I, one by one, I'd say, hey, you know, if I found a school that would take you, would you go? And to my surprise, they all said, yeah. And then I, I couldn't find a school that would take them, you know, so, <laughs> so that forced my hand. So across the street from the church, is our parochial school grades K to eight. First two floors are the school, but the entire third floor was the convent where the ninjas lived. And uh, <laughs> so I gathered all the nuns together in the living room and I sat them down and I said, hey, you know, would you guys mind, you know, moving out and, uh, <laughs> and we could turn the convent into a school for gang members. And they looked at each other and they looked at me and they said, sure. <laughs> that was the extent of their discernment process. <laughs> and so this brought gang members in large numbers to the church, not to services, of course, but uh, to our property. And it created a disconnect. People started to say, wait a minute, aren't churches supposed to be hermetically sealed? You know, good people in, bad people out. That was a good gospel challenge, and in fact, it invited people to the original program. And so the gang members started to say, if only we had jobs. And so myself and the women in the parish, we marched around the factories surrounding the housing projects, trying to find felony-friendly employers. <laughs> and that wasn't so forthcoming, and so we, um, invented things, a maintenance crew, landscaping crew, a crew to build our child care center. And then in 1992 was the Rodney King verdict and the entire city of LA ignited in flames. Except my parish. It was the most likely portion of uh, Los Angeles real estate to ignite and it didn't. So LA Times uh, wanted to know why, so they asked me. I said, well, I think it's because we had 60 strategically hired rival enemy gang members working side by side with each other. And so they had a reason to get up in the morning and a reason not to gang bang the night before and a reason not to ignite their own community. So the next day in the paper, uh, a movie producer named Ray Stark who happened to have $500 million, read the article and summoned me. And he said, how should I spend my money? And now when I look back on it, I, I realize I woefully undershot my request. <laughs> <clears throat> I was young. I said, well, there's an abandoned bakery across the street from the school. It has ovens, you could buy that. We could put hairnets on rival enemy gang members. They could bake bread. We could call it, I don't know, Homeboy Bakery. That was the extent of my business plan. <laughs> and he said, sure. So we were off and running. A month later, we started Homeboy Tortillas in the Grand Central Market. Once we had plural, we changed our name, which we had previously called ourselves Jobs for a Future. We changed it to Homeboy Industries as if there was any industry involved here. <laughs> not everything worked, I'll be the first to admit it. Homeboy Plumbing really was not hugely successful. <laughs> <clears throat> Who knew uh, people didn't want gang members in their homes? I <laughs> did not see that coming. And nobody ever intends to do this, but you back your way into things, you evolve, and if you listen to folks at the margins long enough, the next thing you know, things move and grow, and now we're the largest gang intervention rehab reentry program on our planet. 
15,000 folks. <laughs> Fifteen thousand folks a year walk through our doors. So there are eleven hundred gangs, and they're in LA County, and one hundred twenty thousand gang members. So um, they come in, and most of them want to be part of our eighteen-month training program, which has different phases and things. And healing is the predominant uh, mode, you know, because an educated gang member or inmate may or may not go back to prison. Uh, or an employed one may or may not go back to prison. But it is an absolute guarantee that a healed one won't ever go back to prison. And put a big period at the end of that sentence. So healing is what it's about. Folks come to us with huge chronic toxic stress strapped to their backs like big old backpacks. And they need relief, otherwise they're forced to live in survivor brain and they find a sanctuary at homeboy and then they become the sanctuary they sought and then they go home and they're a sanctuary for their kids suddenly a cycle is broken so we have um, curricular things all the things you'd imagine anger management parenting uh, we have therapy, everybody's in therapy. We have five paid therapists and 47 volunteer, uh, volunteer therapists. We have free tattoo removal, no place on the planet removes more tattoos than we do. We have our own designated clinic in our headquarters. Three laser machines, one paid physician assistant, but 42 volunteer doctors. So if anybody's starting to regret that Billiken tattoo you have, <laughs> Please see me afterwards. <coughs> um, and it was all started, a part of the thing is if you listen, I think Jesus lays out the kind of the two strategies, his and everybody else's. His is anchored in humility, which looks at the folks on the margins and says, what would help? As opposed to hubris, which is the other dynamic in the gospel, the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the priests. Hubris says, here's what your problem is. Here's what you need to fix. So if you listen to folks on the margins, they're gonna tell you what they need and what would help. So tattoo re removal was born because of a guy named Frank. I never met him. Two days out of Corcoran State Prison, he's sitting in front of my desk, tattooed on his forehead, just on his forehead, filling the whole space like it was a damn billboard from here to here to here to here, and it says, Fuck the world. <laughs> and he looks at me and he says, you know, I am having a hard time finding a job. <laughs> <clears throat> and I said, well, Frank, um, maybe we could put our heads together on this one. <laughs> so naturally I hired him and uh, he bagged bread for a while at our bakery and I found a, a doctor who had a laser machine and he donated one month, uh, well, one hour a month to chip away at Frank's forehead and a few others. And pretty soon I had a waiting list of 3,000 gang members who wanted the same service. So we really couldn't stay with that arrangement. Uh, parentheses, Frank is a uh, security guard at a movie studio and there is no trace left of the angriest, dumbest thing he had ever done. <laughs> Proving what uh, Sister Helen Prejean often says, every one of us is a whole lot more than the dumbest, worst things we've ever done. So uh, then we have all our businesses. So uh, we're $19 million annual operation, 9 million of that comes from our social enterprises. Homeboy Bakery, Homeboy Silkscreen, Homeboy Homegirl Merchandise. If you ever fly at Terminal 4, American Airlines, we have a restaurant at, at, at LAX in Los Angeles. We have uh, Farmer's Markets, um, Homeboy Recycling, E-Waste, uh, Homeboy Diner, the only place you can get food at City Hall. Um, 
and uh, Homegirl Cafe, where women with records, young ladies from rival gangs, waitresses with attitude, will gladly take your order. <laughs> and they cater. Um, it's kind of a who's who. I invite you to, to go there, and you always run into somebody. You know, Jim Carrey uh, has often gone there, Jack Black, Forrest Whitaker, um, once the entire Dodgers team. <laughs> Sorry, I don't want to derail myself. And uh, once with only two hours' notice uh, uh, from the White House, uh, Vice President Joe Biden, when he was still Vice President, um, uh, said, I have to have lunch at the Homegirl Cafe. And so was Entourage, Motorcade, selfies with Uncle Joe. I was making my annual eight-day retreat, so I wasn't there. So when I got back, I see this homie, one of our trainees, Louis Moore, and he said, while you were gone, we were visited by an MVP. I said, do you mean a VIP? He said, yep, that one. <laughs> Imagine, gee, here at Homeboy Industries, we were visited by the Vice President of the United States, Mick Romney. <laughs> I think you can file that under all white guys look alike. <laughs> and I believe we added a current affairs class shortly after that. <laughs> but once, quite famously, uh, Diane Keaton showed up for lunch, Oscar winner and Godfather movies, big movie star. And she was there, and her waitress is Glinda. And Glinda's a big girl. Been there, done that, tattooed, gang member, felon, was in prison. She has no idea who Diane Keaton is. So she's taking her order, and Diane Keaton says, what do you recommend? And Glinda rattles off the three dishes that she particularly likes, and Diane Keaton says, I'll have that second one. That one sounds really good. It's at that moment, for some reason, something dawns on Glinda. She looks at Diane Keaton, she says, wait a minute. I feel like I know you from somewhere. <laughs> you know, like maybe we've met. And she decides to kind of deflect it humbly. Oh, gosh, I don't know. I, I suppose I have one of those faces that people think they've seen before. And, and then Glinda goes, no, now I know. We were locked up together. <clears throat> oh boy. That just took my breath away when I heard it. And I don't believe we've had any further Diane Keaton sightings now that I now that I think of it, but suddenly kinship so quickly. Oscar winning actress, attitudinal waitress. Now that quenches God's thirst. That you may be one. My joy yours, your joy complete. I actually don't want anything from you. I only want for you. Go to the margins and watch what happens. In the original covenantal relationship, God says, as I have loved you, now if we created God in our own image, we would say, love me back. But that's not what God says. As I have loved you, so must you have a special preferential care and love for the widow, orphan, and the stranger. And God says that because God thinks these are the folks who know what it's like to have been cut off. And because they have suffered in this way, God thinks they're trustworthy guides to lead the rest of us to the kinship of God. That's where the joy is. They're guides, which means they go ahead of us and we follow. You're not called to the margins to rescue anybody, but go figure if we all go out there 
we all find rescue. All of us are called to be enlightened witnesses, people who through your kindness and tenderness and focused attentive love return people to themselves. But at Homeboy, we do not believe we're allergic to the notion of holding the bar up and asking folks to measure up. We don't do it because we think our God never does it. Why would we do it? Instead of saying measure up, we show up and hold the mirror up and tell people the truth, knowing that your truth is my truth and my truth is a gang member's truth. It's all the same truth. Here's the truth. You are exactly what God had in mind when God made you. Then you watch folks on the margins as they become that truth, as they inhabit that truth. And no bullet can pierce it. No four prison walls can keep that out. Death can't touch it because it's huge. But at Homeboy, we know that part of the task is reaching in and dismantling the messages of shame and disgrace that keep people from seeing their truth. For the principal suffering of the poor throughout history and throughout scripture is shame and disgrace. So part of the original program, as articulated in the Acts of the Apostles, comes in a peculiar sentence where it says simply, and awe came upon everyone. It seems to suggest that the measure of our health in this city, in this community, may well reside in our ability to stand in awe at what the poor have to carry, rather than stand in judgment at how they carry it. So I was invited once to speak to 600 social workers in Richmond, Virginia. And I said yes. And I knew it was a gang in service from nine to five at a hotel. <coughs> so I figured I was the keynote, maybe open it, maybe lunch, maybe close the thing. So I had my ticket and it was a week away and I pulled the letter out and to my horror, I discover that I am to be the only speaker from nine to five the whole damn day. <laughs> and I said, oh, hell no. <laughs> so I bring two homies in, Andre and Jose, and I sit them down. Both of them are gang members, both of them are trainees. I said, look, you're flying with me to Richmond, Virginia. I'd like you to get up and tell your stories. Take your time. Because <laughs> we got a long ass day to fill. Well, I'd never heard their stories, and uh, so uh, Jose gets up first, and he's about 25 years old. And gang member tattooed, been to prison, but he fin was finishing up his time in our 18 month program uh, as a very valued member of our substance abuse team, a man solid in his own recovery. Now he was helping younger homies with their addiction issues. Um, he was in prison, but he also had a long stretch of time as a homeless man and an even longer stretch as a heroin addict. And he gets up and he says, I guess you could say my mom and me, we didn't get along so good. I think I was six when she looked at me and she said, why don't you just kill yourself? You're such a burden to me. Well, 600 social workers audibly gasp. And then he says, it sounds way worse in Spanish. <laughs> yeah, we got whiplash going from gasp to laugh. I think I was nine when my mom drove me down to the deepest part of Baja California. And she walks me up to an orphanage and she knocks on the door. When the guy comes to the door, she says, I found this kid. 
And she left me there for 90 days until my grandmother could get out of her where she had dumped me. And my grandmother rescued me. My mom beat me every single day of my elementary school years with things you could imagine and with a lot of things you couldn't. Every day my back was bloodied and scarred. In fact, I had to wear three t-shirts to school every day. First t-shirt, because the blood would seep through. Second t-shirt, you could still see it. Finally, the third t-shirt, you couldn't see any blood. Kids at school, they make fun of me. Hey, fool, it's 100 degrees. Why are you wearing three t-shirts? Then he stopped speaking, so overwhelmed with emotion. And he seemed to be staring at a piece of his story that only he could see. And when he could regain his speech, he said through his tears, I wore three t-shirts well into my adult years because I was ashamed of my wounds. I didn't want anybody to see them. But now I welcome my wounds. I run my fingers over my scars. My wounds are my friends. After all, how can I help heal the wounded if I don't welcome my own wounds? And awe came upon everyone. The measure of our compassion lies not in our service of those on the margins, but only in our willingness to see ourselves in kinship with them. For the truth of the matter is this, if we don't welcome our own wounds, we may well be tempted to despise the wounded. <coughs> Let me end with uh, this story and then, uh, you know, and we'll do some Q&A. And we won't, uh, you know, do the microphone thing. Because I've done this with even larger groups than this. And you just go like this and you holler it out. Because the truth of the matter, only certain people walk up to microphones. And, and so you want to be able to hear folks who wouldn't normally say anything. So think of your question. I was thinking, in terms of the original program, I was interviewed once on the Christian Broadcast Network. And this woman asked me what we did at Homeboy. And so I said all the things I said to you, tattoo removal, job training, therapy, healing, a community of tenderness, uh, attachment repair, social enterprises. I went on and on and on. And when I finished, she looked at me and she said, yeah, but how much time do you spend each day at Homeboy, you know, praising God? And I didn't know what to say to that. So I looked at her and I said, all damn day. <laughs> and I don't think she liked that answer very much. <laughs> but it begs the question, especially from a God who doesn't want anything from us, only wants for us, what kind of praise does this exhausted God have any interest in. So let me end with this story. It occurs sometimes to universities um, to force students to read my book against their will. <laughs> so I'm not complaining, but... Um, so um, my alma mater, Gonzaga University in Spokane, 
force the incoming freshman class to read my book. So they said, can you come and speak there? And I said, sure. And there was going to be a huge venue with a thousand people. And, uh, oh, can you bring two homies with you? So I always, if somebody's going to pay for it, I bring homies. And um, I always pick homies the same way. I always pick rivals among the trainees, guys who are enemies, just so that they have to share a hotel room just to mess with them. <laughs> and I always pick homies who have never flown before just for the thrill <clears throat> of seeing gang members panicked in the sky. Not long ago, I went to D.C. with two homies, older guys, you know, and, and one homie said, hey, are we flying Virgin Airlines because it's our first time? <clears throat> and I said, well, why, yes, it's a requirement. Uh, we'll be coming home on American, but... Uh, so um, I picked two homies, Bobby, African-American gang member worked in the bakery and Mario, who at the time worked in our merchandise store. I've done this hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of times. I've never had anybody more petrified of flying than this guy, Mario. It was like unbelievable. I, I've had nerves, people with nerves, but never absolutely terrified. In fact, he was hyperventilating. <laughs> I can't do it with my voice. <clears throat> and we hadn't even boarded the plane yet. <laughs> so we're at... Uh, Burbank Airport is a small airport with big bay windows, Southwest Airlines, big planes, huge planes. But they don't have that hermetically sealed chute that you walk through. You have to walk out onto the tarmac, like you're the president, and, and you climb up those steps to get to the front of the plane, and the big feature at uh, Burbank is you, they have steps at the back of the plane. And <clears throat> I'm sitting there with Mario, and Bobby's off walking somewhere, and our plane arrives, it's early morning, and, and I said, that's our plane. And, oh, I, and he's just like having this horrible panic attack. And, and, uh, and so then I see our uh, two flight attendants, females, and they both have very large cups of Starbucks coffee. And they're schlepping up the steps, you know, and Mario goes, when are we going to board the plane? I said, as soon as they sober up the pilots. <laughs> <coughs> There, there they go now. Perhaps I shouldn't have said that, you know, so I should tell you that Mario in my 30 year history is the most tattooed individual who's ever worked there. I mean, he's all sleeved out, neck blackened with the name of his gang, head shaved, covered in tattoos, forehead, cheeks, chin, eyelids, covered in tattoos. And I'd never been in public with him, so we were walking through the airport and people are like this, you know, and, and mothers are clutching their kids a little more closely. And, and I'm thinking that's interesting because if you were to go to Homeboy tomorrow uh, and say, who's the kindest, most gentle, tender soul here? They won't say me. They'll say, oh, Mario, yeah. Mario now works at the bakery counter selling baked goods. Yeah, Mario is. Mario is proof that only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any shot at changing the world. So we get to Gonzaga and this happens only all the time. They have the big talk like this, which they told you about, but what they don't tell you about is they plan 93 other talks, you know, this class, this lunch, this class, this meeting, this class. So I tell these two, look, I'm not going to talk at any of those. I'm going to sit in the back of the classroom. You get up, tell your stories. Well, they were nervous, especially Mario, but they do a good job. Stories of terror and torture and violence and abuse of every imaginable kind. Honest to God, if their stories had been flames, you'd have to keep your distance. Otherwise, you'd get scorched. I would not have survived a day of their childhood. So the night time came and I kind of shaked it up a little bit before I said, look, I know you weren't planning to do this. I want you both to get up before me, do a little seven minute snapshot of your life. 
so that I can include you standing next to me for the Q&A. Well, they were terrified because it was really a lot of people. But they got up and they did a good job. I did my thing and then I call them up here. Yeah, yeah, questions. Yes, ma'am, and a woman stands and uh, she says, yeah, I got a question, it's for Mario. First question out the gate. Mario is this tall, skinny drink of water and he's clutching the microphone. Yes, <laughs> more terrified than the flight. And she says, well, you say you're a father and you have a son and a daughter that are about to enter their teenage years. What wisdom do you impart to them? You know, what advice do you give them? Mario closes his eyes and he clutches more intensely the microphone and I can feel the emotions rising and he's trembling and he's getting a damn hernia trying to come up with whatever the hell he's gonna say. When suddenly he blurts out, I just, and as soon as he says these two words, he retreats back into his closed eyed microphone clutching retreat but he wants to get this sentence out. I just don't want my kids to turn out to be like me. And there's silence until the woman who asked the question stands and now it's her turn to cry. Why wouldn't you want your kids to turn out to be like you? You are loving. You are kind, you are gentle, you are wise. I hope your kids turn out to be like you. And a thousand total perfect strangers stand and they will not stop clapping. And all Mario can do is hold his face in his hands so overwhelmed that this room full of strangers had decided to return him to himself. But they in turn likewise returned, which shouldn't surprise us because it's mutual. And I think that's the only praise God has any interest in. That's the original program. And that is the God we actually have. And so we go to the margins. And we brace ourselves because people will accuse us of wasting our time. But the prophet Jeremiah writes, in this place of which you say it is a waste, there will be heard again the voice of mirth and the voice of gladness, the voices of those who sing. The original program is to allow those voices to be heard. For the folks at the margins, they are our trustworthy guides to get us to the community of kinship, which is God's dream come true. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. I promise you, I won't exceed 8.30. And thank you for those who bought the book and I signed a bunch of them before and, and then we had to cut it short, so I'll sign the rest of them. So, question, just go like this, I'll go like that, or comment.
The question is about what do you say to somebody who lost a friend to gang violence? Uh, you know, I'm not much on, I just spoke to you for an hour. I'm not much on words. <laughs> don't believe in it. I, but I kind of don't, you know. Because we always think that way, you know. That I will say the one thing that's going to make this person whatever. Not be grieving. That's not going to happen. People just need to be held. People need to know that you're there. Hope is the thing with feathers that perches in the soul, that sings the song without the words and never stops at all. I believe in singing the song without the words, but we're utterly reliant on that notion that somehow we have to say the right thing. And that's, that's the beauty of accompaniment, and that's the beauty of exquisite mutuality. And that's the beauty of resting in the stillness of love and loving in the stillness of God, that it's, uh, it's beyond words, which I think is important. Yeah, way back there. I was never frightened working with gang members, I'll be honest with you. Uh, you know, meeting payroll terrifies me. <laughs> I, I'm not joking. That keeps me awake. Um, no, because, you know, you discover so quickly, you cannot demonize somebody you know. So once you're in the vicinity of anybody, you know, then, you know, people are human beings. And, um, and then it becomes easy to trade in judgment for awe. And then that's kind of the God we actually have, who doesn't have any time for judging. And judging takes up all the room that's meant for your loving. And you don't want that to happen. And, and fear just comes from not knowing, it's sort of an ignorant place. But as soon as you know people, I always felt the safest in the middle of the night in riding my bike in the projects, go figure. Even if there were shootings, you know, I still felt kind of held. So no, I never did. But there was one right up here, yeah. Well, like in recovery, the question is, do we seek people or, or do we go out to them or, or do they just come to us? Our program is not for those who need help. It's only for those who want it. So uh, you have to walk through the doors. In the same way any recovery program, you know, if we were an alcohol recovery program rather than a gang recovery program, you know, would you go out at night to bars? and sidle up to people and <laughs> couldn't help notice. <laughs> that was your eighth beer. <laughs> well, you laugh because you would never do it in an alcohol rehab center. And it's the same with us. So I've, in 30 years, I've changed a lot. In the early days, you know, put down that Uzi. Are you sure you want to shoot that guy? Peace treaties, truces, ceasefires. I don't regret that I did it and I'd never do it again. It's born of a bad analysis. It, it's about thinking that gangs are the Middle East or Northern Ireland, if we just bring the two sides together. Gang violence is about something else. Once I said that to somebody, how can you be against peacemaking? You're a priest, I go, I'm old fashioned. <laughs> I think peacemaking requires conflict. There is no conflict in gang violence. There's violence, but there's no conflict. It's not about anything. We just want to practice our religion freely. We would like to have our homeland back. No, it's not about anything at all. It's the language of the despondent who can't imagine tomorrow. It's the language of the traumatized who just can't see their way clear to transform their pain so they keep transmitting it. 
And it's the language of the mentally ill. So, as a society, we seek to infuse hope to kids for whom hope is foreign. We try to heal the traumatized and the damaged. And we try to deliver mental health services in a timely, culturally appropriate way. But it is the principle of like recovery. It's the principle of attraction, not, uh, what's the word? Not promotion, we don't promote. Even, I should say that in 2008, <clears throat> a, a delegation from Wichita came and they wanted to have a uh, airlift homeboy into Wichita, like a franchise. <laughs> and we had to think about it. We said, do we want to become the McDonald's of gang intervention programs, you know, with over five billion gang members served, you know? <laughs> and we decided not to do that. So, um, so we said, well, why don't we offer technical assistance? So, but we don't promote that either. People come to us. We had Savannah last week. We had Scotland the week before. So now we have 147 programs modeled on Homeboy in the United States and uh, 16 outside the country. We just started Tunisia. So I say we started, we don't really. They come to us, hang out for like a week or longer, and then they go home and they take, steal everything that they want. We don't care. <coughs> and then they start it there in their uh, locale. We gather every August for what we call the gathering. And we have 400 people from all over the world who we call partners. And it's all about a methodology. You know, it's if love is the answer, community is the context, tenderness is the methodology. Because without tenderness, love stays in the air or in your head or in your heart. But unless it becomes tender, there is no connective tissue. Jean Vanier, who started the L'Arche community, says that the highest form of spiritual, spirituality is tenderness. So that's kind of a, a principle there, that it's all about relationship. Now, healing ends in the graveyard. But we talk about 18 months as essential healing, foundational healing. And that if you cooperate fully and surrender to that, then you'll get to a place uh, where, where that works, you know. But tenderness is kind of our thing. Uh, and what joins all these programs modeled on Homeboy, there are certain things like social enterprises and, you know, tattoo removal makes sense to our partners in Guatemala City, but not at all to our partners in Glasgow or Sydney. But tenderness is kind of the thing. Um, I'll give a, just a, an example. Um, I'm in my office and it's all glass and closed so I can see out. And it's right in the center so I can see who walks in at any given time. And I have four donors sitting in front of me. And I look over their heads and a guy has just walked in and he's, uh, he's a gang member, I can tell, tattoos. and. But he seems kind of erratic and he has a soda can and he's punctuating every sentence with the soda can. And soda leaps out of the can with every period and every exclamation point. And I can see the homies who are at the huge reception desk, which is this huge thing. And I go, oh no. So I know it's a combo burger of meth and madness. So I'm about to excuse myself to go deal with him when the head of our security, Miguel Lugo, uh, shows up. He's the largest vato who's ever worked there. He's just huge. He spent 18 years in prison since he was 17. Half of those years in solitary confinement. So he puts his arm around this guy and he walks him outside. And Miguel tells me later what, what happens. He stands outside and he's looking at the guy and the guy lifts up his t-shirt and there's a gun tucked into the front of his pants and then he drops the shirt. Miguel says, how about you and me 
we walk down to Alvera Street and I'll buy you some tacos. And he lifts the shirt again and he says, how about I put a bullet in your head? And Miguel says, two tacos or three? <laughs> so they walk down the street and Miguel's telling me that as he's walking, this guy is having a conversation or rather the voices in his head are having a conversation, but they're not staying in his head. They're leaping out of his mouth like a bunch of frogs, you know. Shoot his ass. No, he's okay. You can't trust him. He's buying me tacos. <laughs> and it went like that all the way down the three blocks <laughs> till they get to Alameda and he buys them three tacos. And Miguel tells me that he takes the first taco and he throws it on the ground no doubt feeding the tormented voice in his head. Then he gobbled up the other two tacos, like the ravished, hungry pobrecito that he was. And Miguel is proof that only the soul that ventilates the world with tenderness has any chance of changing the world. You don't go to the margins and then once you're out there, you feel superior to them. That's never happened to me. The day won't ever come when I can express more tenderness than this guy Miguel. Now that's a trustworthy guide. How about one last question? Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, first, thank you so much for being here. Sure. Uh, but I, I wanted to touch on SLU's culture of service, and so you'll find a lot of students here who are so focused on doing service all the time. Uh, but I wanted to hear from you, what are some of the biggest or most common misconceptions that students or volunteer groups will have when they move out to those marginalized communities and intend on doing good? That's great. You could all hear them, couldn't you? <laughs> <coughs> Again, I, I, you know, it's, it's hard for us to let go of doing. You know, when people come, we have 300 volunteers. What will I do here? No, 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 wrong question. What will happen to you here? That's where you want to get to. Once a woman came to my office and said, uh, uh, I have to volunteer at Homeboy Industries. I said, why do you have to volunteer at Homeboy Industries? I believe I have a message these young people need to hear. I go, yikes. <laughs> they do me a favor. The second you lo lose that uh, message, I hope you come back to us, you know. I don't want the message. It's not about message. It's not even about messenger. It's about losing yourself in accompaniment. It's a tough one because who doesn't say, when I graduate from SLU, I just want to go out there and I want to make a difference. And I, I'm wanting, I want to suggest to re retire that. Don't. Because there's no way to make that statement make a difference without it being about you. There's just no way, you can't do it. It has to be about you if it's make a difference. Saving, rescuing, fixing, making a difference. That's, I think, key. You go to the margins not to make a difference. You go to the margins so that the folks at the margins make you different. I'll, I'll end with this because it's a, a recent one for me. Um, <coughs> so there was a homie named Danny who, I, I met him when he was 13, tough kid, really into his gang, really did dirt, uh, really terrible family situation. I knew him because I would be out in the street, so this alley where his gang 
kicked it. So I knew him from there. Bad attitude. He said to me once, I will never step foot in Homeboy Industries, you know. And I go, hmm, all right. So consequently and subsequently, I would meet him at juvenile hall and then probation camp and then uh, youth authority. And finally he went to prison at 18 for only a two year stretch. And in recovery, they always say it takes what it takes, the death of a friend, a long stretch in prison, the birth of a son. For Danny, this is what it took. He got out of prison and his mother had six months to live pancreatic cancer. Large family, but he was the one who was kind of the hospice point person. And I'd be there with him and I'd watch his tenderness with her. All the more remarkable because she tortured him as a kid. And yet there he was. So she died. A week later, I buried her. A week after that, he walks in for the first time to Homeboy Industries. And then I watched him, you know, get his GED. And I watched him laugh with guys he used to shoot at. And then one day he comes into my office and he says, what happened to me yesterday has never happened to me in my life. And he tells me that he got on the Gold Line train, which is right outside, across the street, the Chinatown stop, and he's taking it east to go home. It's a packed train, but he gets a seat. Standing right in front of him, hanging onto a pole, he says, is a medio pedo guy, a, little, a guy who's a little bit drunk. He's a homie because I can see tattoos on his hands. Older guy, I don't know who he is. And Danny's wearing a sweatshirt that fills his whole chest that says, jobs, not jails, homeboy industries. And the guy who's a little bit drunk hanging on the pole, he looks at him and he says, hey, you work there? And Danny doesn't know if he should really engage this guy, so he kind of shrugs and says, yeah. Is it any good? And Danny says, well, it's helped me. In fact, I don't think I'm ever going to go back to prison because of this place. Then Danny gets up and he pulls out a piece of paper and he has a pen. And he writes down the address at Homeboy Industries. And as he's telling me the story, he says, I couldn't believe I knew the address by heart. <laughs> And he stands in front of the guy and he hands him the piece of paper and he says, call us, come see us, we'll help you. And the guy studies the piece of paper and he says, thank you. And the train stops and the guy gets off and Danny sits down. And now he returns to his previous refrain. He says, what happened to me next? has never happened to me in my life. Everyone on the train was looking at me. Everyone on the train was nodding at me. Everyone on the train was smiling at me. And now he can barely speak at all. And for the first time in my life, I felt admired. And the two of us, we just wept. Because I don't know what the hell you say to something as amazing as that. That this exhausted God inches us closer and closer to each other. Where you're not supposed to do very much except Enjoy it. And just watch and appreciate how mutually ennobling this can be. God doesn't want anything from us. But God wants for us.
and wants us to put ourselves in the vicinity where God's joy can be ours and our joy complete. Thank you very much.